Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word. And we invite your spirit into our hearts, into our minds, that you can unite us together. And we ask that your truths can heal this sin sick mind and heart, um, that we can uh, behold things in your word that angels desire to look into. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you can be with each person, with their family, and in the ministry that we have uh, to one another and those around us. Uh, we pray for this movement and the people in it. We know, Lord, that sometimes we have a hard time understanding what's going on, but we know, Lord, that you see all things, and so we leave all things in your hands. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, good morning again. And so we're, we're going to kind of go over what we've been doing, just kind of I've been thinking about it a little bit. And so uh, we'll just jump right in here. Now, Stephen brought this up just before the study, so I want to look at it. Now, we have in in these verses, so if we go back to verse 25, we have, he shall stir his up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So we know that this is the king of the north, or, or the, pardon me, uh, the king of the south and the king of the north. So the king of the north is stirring up his power. That's, it's, he's awakening. He's arising, right? Uh, waking up from slumber. So he's going to stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. Now, when we look at this verse, how do we generally apply it? What is this verse about? So this is going to be Octavian, right? Conquering Antony. Antony is going to be the king of the south with Cleopatra. And, and then you have Octavian. Okay. Now, one thing we can say about this is that in, in a present truth application, we can say that this is 1989, that it typifies 1989. But what we never noticed in this verse before is that it's going to tell us that this event typifies 1989. That is, it's going to talk about at the time, at, um, at the end shall be the time appointed, right? That's going to be in verse 27. And so we're going to get to this Moat. So, um, so when we looked at these verses, we say, okay, this is going to be the defeat of uh, Egypt, right? The Ptolemic Tele Empire. And it's going to become part of, of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is the king of the north. Egypt's the king of the south. And then we dealt with the verse 26, yea, that they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So, you know, we try to figure out who is this. And, and it could be basically... All of the armies, Egypt has supplied the food, not just to the armies of the king of the north, not just to Rome, but also to it, its own army. And in the end, it's going to be these combined forces that are going to defeat Egypt. Right. But we also have this typology of the Sunday law that we see in Daniel 11, verse 40. Right. And onwards. Right. So we can see that this is typifying this. And then it talks about both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table. So it's going to go back to this agreement that Antony and Octavian have. But it shall not prosper. And then it says, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And when we looked at this, uh, it says, you know, certainly it shall repeat at the end at the time appointed, right? So this is referring to the time of the end. At the end, at this, uh, that's cats, that's the extremity, that word end, um, cats. And and at the time appointed, that's moed, right? So moed is, and we looked at Daniel chapter 8, verse 19, where it talks about uh, the time at the time appointed shall be, uh, what was the word there? Just going to go back, Chip. 
8, Daniel 8, 19, what will be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. So we can see that the time appointed is again connected to the end, the kets. Okay, that's the word kets. It's uh, kof and sadi. Okay, so, um, and then the time appointed to Moed. You got Moed, you got Ketz. And those are the same words in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 27, right? So you got again Ketz and Moed, right? So that means it's talking about the same thing. And in Daniel chapter 8, ever since I understood Daniel chapter 8 as an Adventist, I always understood that at the time appointed, the end shall be, that's referring to Millerite history. That is, you have the time of the end, 1798, and then you have the Day of Atonement, the Moed, October 22, 1844. So it's referring to that period of time from the time of the end until the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, so that's how I've understood it for 30, well, 40 years, let's say. And now, we run into this same expression here in Daniel chapter 11. But we also have this other word, yet. And that means an iteration, right? So it's talking about something that has happened or is going to happen that is going to happen again. So now it, it's told us this, that this is about the time of the end, 1798 to 1844. That that these events are typifying those future events. Now, then it says, then he shall return to his land with great riches. So this is going to refer to the event uh, of the conquering of Egypt. And his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. So obviously, this can't still be Octavian. So when he returns to his own land, this is just talking about Rome. In, 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 in more general sense. And Rome is going to persecute God's people. He shall do and return to his own land. So it's going to have twice that he returns to his own land, once with Egypt, and the other one with being against the Holy Covenant, right? And, and we can say that this is referring to all of this persecution that occurs including the destruction of Jerusalem. So this isn't just, you know, the crucifixion of Christ. It's the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution that follows, because it's already told us about this in verse 24, right? So it, it doesn't, doesn't expand on it. And then it says in verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return. So the he is Rome again, and he's going to come towards the south. But it shall not be as the former when he conquered Egypt the first time or as the latter. And the question is, when is this latter? Is it what we see in verse 28? That is, when he's against the Holy Covenant and he does these exploits, he does things, right? And then he returns into his own land. And so to hear here, the time appointed is pointing to 1989 because we already had a time appointed that's 1798 and we have a time appointed that's 1989. And so there are things that are similar. That is the king of the north is going to conquer the king of the south and there is going to be persecution of God's people. And then it's going to talk about the fall of Rome, right? So it's going to move into the fall of Rome. And the question is why? So it says, for the ships of Kittim. Now, when we looked at this, there is a word that's not that's not translated or numbered. Uh, it's the word boo, okay? And uh, this word is, uh, let me see here, is, it's best translated in which. So it's it's talking about this this these events. And then it says, at the time appointed, he shall return, come towards the south. But it shall, not, it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So in the latter, it's in which the ships of Kittim shall come against him 
Uh, therefore, sh he shall be grieved in return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So, but something happens here. He, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So to understand this, we know that this is going to be talking about the fall of Rome and what does what happens at the fall of Rome. So what happens when the daily is taken away? When Rome falls, and it's going to happen in these three steps, we're going to have the setting up of the papacy, right? Yes. Okay. So that means the thing that is not the same as this history in which God's people are being persecuted is that it's not pagan Rome, but it's papal Rome that's going to be acting at the end of time. Does that make sense to people? That there is a change that has occurred from pagan Rome to papal Rome. So even though these things are typifying what's going to happen at the time of the end, at the time appointed, we're not going to be dealing with pagan Rome anymore. That is, the king of the north is no longer going to be pagan Rome. It's going to be papal Rome. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, it does. Anybody else? Is is this hard to grasp? Is it simple? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Because this is quite a different way of looking at this passage. I think it's a more in-depth way of looking at it. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's it's definitely in-depth, but it is different. But it it to me, it helps the flow of the narrative make sense. And the fact that it's going to mention the time appointed, which is going to be 1798, and the time appointed when he shall return and come towards the south as 1989, explains everything that's then going to flow into Dan all the way to the end of Daniel, you know, 45, right? Especially when you get to Daniel 11, verse 40. So Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But especially verse 40, because it's going to address both times of the end, right? And it, and it's, I don't know. To me, it's just, it's it's such a revelation. I'm still having a hard time kind of accepting it and, and understanding it. But it just seems to make the most sense based on what we're what we've been studying, how we've been studying Daniel chapter 11. For one, I don't, I can't accept that the time appointed here can refer to the end of the 360 years because it is such a specific term from Daniel chapter 8 that definitely does not refer to the period at the end of 360 years. And we could just say, well, it's in a general sense, every time you have an end of a time prophecy, it's going to be a time appointed, but that's not the case. This is a very specific word, moed, and it's attached to uh, the end, at the time appointed, the end shall be, or the end shall be at the time appointed. And if you compare these... I think... Uh, uh, yeah. I Go think on. is it Uriah Smith or maybe Swearingen, either one of them, they don't apply it to the end of the 360. They apply it to the beginning of the 360. So they apply it to 31 BC. The end shall be at the time appointed. Is, a, is sort of the beginning of the 360. That's not how I interpret what they wrote. Are you sure that that's what they're saying? Because uh, I think one I, of them, one of them made that application. Okay. Well, here, let me look at Uriah Smith. So, um, cause I just have it here. So based on, on this one, he doesn't seem to say anything about the time of the end in this. Uh, so I'm not sure where the end shall be at the time appointed. Uh, maybe it's here. Time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse 24, which has previously been mentioned. It closed as already shown in AD 330, at which time this power was to return and come again towards the south, but not as on the former occasion when it went into Egypt, right? So this is where he says, so they're going to talk about moving the seat of the empire from Constantin from Rome to Constantinople. And, and this doesn't really make any sense. That, that, that they're coming towards the south. Because when we looked at Swearingen, the problem that we had there was, I'm just going to open it up for some reason. So when he says it, he says, you know, that they're moving towards the south when they move towards, you know, they're, they're moving south when they're moving east. And, and I had a hard time with that, that it's, it's 
There's nothing about toward the south by moving to Constantinople. And so I tried to figure out why he why he used that. So that was one of the things is it, well, this doesn't make sense. There is no moving towards the south. I'm just trying to find this again. So he says, um, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it should not be as the former as the latter. The passage points out that the Roman Empire, at the time appointed, the end of the 360-year prophecy, would return by coming toward not to, not to the south. And, of course, that's not really supported by uh, the Hebrew. Anyway, this return would not be like the former time when Octavian, the king of the north, conquered Egypt in 30 BC, or the latter time, the future conquest of Egypt by the king of the north. So, so he's going to apply this, the latter, as being what I would call the time appointed, right? So he kind of switches them around, uh, but peacefully without intention of waging war. So he says, when Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, thus re- relocating the imperial capital toward Egypt, that is in the direction of Egypt, but not exactly to Egypt itself having peaceful intentions, which it's not supported by the Hebrew, but also moving directly east is not moving towards the south. And, okay, so and that, what, Yes, I, I get that point. <clears throat> but uh, what I have of swear engine on verse 27, um, so okay. concerning... It shall not prosper for the end shall be at the time appointed. He says, thus, the artificial alliance between Anthony and Octavian would not prosper, but come to an end at the appointed time through his victory at the Actium and the final subjugation of Hellenistic Egypt, 3130 BC. Octavian would eventually stand alone as the sole ruler of the pagan Roman Empire. Right. So he's going to have two different times appointed here. So in 27, he just said the time appointed when Egypt is basically going to fall, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so he does do that in verse 27. But then he's not consistent because this – now, you could say I'm not consistent because I'm saying one time appointed is 1798 and one is 1989. But the thing is they're part of the same history because – for there is a time appointed that is 1798, but also in the time of the end, we're going to have the king of the south come and defeat the king of the north. But when it does it, it's not going to be as when they first defeated Egypt, and it's not going to be as when they went against the Holy Covenant, when they went against God's people, right? Because now we're going to have this change so, yeah, so I see what you're saying. He does try to put that time appointed as the end of Egypt. But then mine's, mine's consistent in that the time appointed is referring to Millerite history and the repeat of Millerite history. The two times of the ends, which we do have in Daniel 11, verse 40. Right. Because in a sense, when it talks about at the time of the end, in verse 40, right? So when we go there, we know that the time of the end is 1798. But when the king of the north comes against the king of the south like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and many ships and shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over, that that is also the time of the end. But in a sense, these are both the same time of the end in that 1798 and 1989 are connected histories, right? They're part of the same line. Ellen White, in a sense, has them as part of the same line. So we're in this history of the time of the end. And the repeat of history, the repeat of Millerite history, which is our history, has this time of the end attached to it, which is the time appointed, which is really referring ultimately to the Sunday law, Right. Not really to the time of the end, because the time of the end is a period of time from the time of the end to the Sunday law. In Millerite history, that's going to go to October 22nd, 1844, beginning the judgment. And in our history, it's going to be 1989 uh, to the end of the judgment, dealing, uh, addressing the Sunday law. Does that make sense? So to have the time appointed to be the end of Egypt and then 
um, the next one to be the end of the 360. So he has, he has, he has the time appointed as the beginning of the 360 and the end of the 360, according to swearing me, instead of being, uh, 1798 and 1989. A- any more thoughts on that? Yeah, that's fine. I was just, um, pointing out what swearing is. Yep. Yeah, it's good you did. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and because we did kind of address it before, but, um, uh, so, so now then when we look at this, uh, you know, we say the latter and the former, there are, there, there is a time at the end that addresses the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution that's going to happen to God's people, because we know the destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the end of the world. So we have uh, the fall of Egypt, which is, is also typifying what happens in 1989 the king of the north defeating the king of the south. Well, what we have is this change. And then remember, when we get to 538, it is a counterfeit of the cross, right? That is the two 1260s, paganism and papalism, counterfeit the week of Christ. And with the events of the sixth century, we have a transition from 508 to 538. Um, a transition from pagan to papal Rome, from an earthly counterfeit to a heavenly counterfeit. Right? Christ ministers for three and a half years on earth and three and a half years in heaven. He confirms the covenant with those two periods of three and a half years. And so this is the counterfeit or the satanic covenant, right? Covenant week, so to speak. So we can see here then once we, once we get to Verse 31, we have the fall of the Roman Empire in verse 30. We get to verse 31. We now have something, an important verse to study. And that's verse 31. Verse 31 says, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, those who uh, believe that it's Hyacus Epiphanes is the subject of this prophecy here. They're going to have this, the pollution of the temple in Jerusalem and and the taking away of the daily, of the removal of the daily sacrifice. That's why sacrifice is in the text as an added word, because it is an interpretation of this passage, right? And, and, And I want to address that a little bit further. So if we look at, well, we could use Adam Clark. So just this is an example of how other people understand this. After Antiochus, arms, that is the Romans, shall stand up for arms in this prophecy everywhere denote military power and standing up the power and activity and conquering both Sir Isaac Newton and Bishop Newton agree that what follows is spoken of the Romans. Okay, so here he has a view that this is the Romans. Let me see if maybe it's Barnes. Ah. Yeah, so Barnes is going to say, up to this verse, there's a general agreement among commentators that the reference is to Antiochus Epiphanes. No, he's going to have a view that this changes to the Romans as well. Okay, so you can see these commentators don't accept that Antiochus Epiphanes is being referred to here. Um, so I think they might refer to this as, yeah, so they're going to use apply this to the destruction of Jerusalem, where uh, the Maccabean theorists, they're going to apply this to Atticus Epiphanes. So I expected to see some of these commentators. Well, let's see what Matthew Henry says. So Matthew Henry, he's going to go through this. I'm just going to see if he, when he gets with verse 31. Yeah. So he's going to have this as Atticus Epiphanes. So there's a disagreement among commentators. Now, we understand, though, that Rome has come in sooner. This isn't talking about a type of his epiphanies that this is talking about Rome. So when arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily and shall place the abomination that make it desolate. One thing we can't do is apply this to the destruction of Jerusalem. So this sanctuary of strength, what is it? Now it's a mikdash is the Hebrew word that's translated sanctuary. And strength actually refers to a fortified place. Right. 
uh, that is like a power. It's the word ma'az, which is similar to the word oz, that um, where you talk about uh, they shall break the pride of his power. That word power is oz. So this is just ma'az. It has a mem in front of it. So they are related. And in a sense, called, what's that? Well, we know Kodesh is only can only be God's sanctuary, and Mikdash is yeah. any sanctuary. Right. Yeah. So both of these to the context to the context. So if you have Kodesh, now now Kodesh can refer to God's sanctuary, both on earth and in heaven. Mikdash can only refer to an earthly sanctuary. It's never used in reference to the heavenly sanctuary. Yeah. Now, okay. now so both the word Kodesh and Oz here have a mem placed in front of them. So it's going to be Mikdash, right, instead of Kodesh, and it's going to be Maaz instead of Oz. So the mem in front of a Hebrew word, um, I'm just going to give you it. From, so the mem prefix means from. Okay. And now, so it's put in front of, of words. And, and 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 it's also the word mem also means sea or water, but when it's put in front in a prefix, I'm trying to remember how to say this. Okay, well I'm going to look it up in Wikipedia here. So we got we got different prefixes: vav prefix, lamed, bet, kaf, mem. So it just means from. So from. So I guess if you wanted to be the te- sanctuary. So the, why would it have from in front of of the word sanctuary? From, from in front of the word kodesh, if it's if it's not referring to God's sanctuary, because kodesh means holy, and it means from holy. Well, where is the word from? I don't see the, the word from it, on that. It in Hebrew, when you have mikdash, you put a, the letter M in front of the word kodesh. That's how it becomes mikdash. And the letter M as a prefix to a word means from. So okay, literally, I got so literally you're referring to the sanctuary from holy. And, and then Moaz is from strength. But, but the question is why, why do they put that in front of the word? Because I mean, you're not really literally in English that wouldn't make much sense. Right. So if you're putting it in front of word to change the form of that word, what is it saying about that word? So if you're if you're using mikdash instead of kodesh, what is why would you use mikdash and not kodesh? You in verse thirty one. Yeah, in verse thirty one, it's the, the word sanctuary. There is mikdash. Now, the word sanctuary can also be translated from the Hebrew word kodesh, which means holy, but mikdash refers to a sanctuary. And that sanctuary can be, sometimes the temple in Jerusalem can be referred to as Mikdash. But pagan sanctuaries are never referred to as Kodesh. Though the earthly sanctuary for the Jews can be called Kodesh. So the question is, why do they put from in front of a word? I mean, we don't don't do that in English. Right? We We wouldn't, but it's distinguishing something by putting the mem in front of Kodesh to get Mikdash, right? So you got the M sound in front of Kodesh makes it Mikdash. So can you think why they would do that? It's not, it's not really obvious because we don't do that in English. I have to find something similar and, and similar in other scriptures to see that. Okay. Well, well, every time they refer to a pagan sanctuary, they call it Mikdash. They never call it Kodesh. So Kodesh means holy. Um, Mikdash means sanctuary. Right? Now sanctuary just means a holy place. So so the question is, why do they not ever call a pagan sanctuary Kodesh? So there's something about the mem at the beginning of the word that is, is saying that it's like this, but it's not. Does it mean that it's not? Because... The earthly sanctuary can be called Mikdash, but usually it's referring to the sanctuary building itself, not to the, definitely the holy place is always called Kodesh. And, mm-hmm. and the most holy place is always called Kodesh, Kodeshim, right? Mm-hmm. 
I got you. You wouldn't call the most holy place Mikdash, but you can call the whole sanctuary Mikdash. So, so it just means it's from something. So the idea here is what's that? Can you spell Mikdash? Uh, in Hebrew or English? It don't make no difference. <laughs> okay, well. Mig, 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 mig dash, how do you spell it? How do you say it? Mig dash. Yeah, so I'll just show you here on the computer. It'd be very much like M-I-Q-D-A-S-H. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there. All right. So there's, there's the word mem, kof, dalit, and shin. Mig dash. M-I-Q-D-A-S-H. Sometimes it has a dot in the in the kof, which means you have mik kadash. Sometimes pronounced that way. I was just making sure I had the right word. Yeah. Right. yeah. So anyway, when they when they add this mem to it, so one of the things we can say here is is I would argue that this is not referring to the heavenly sanctuary. Definitely, it's not. We can agree there because it's not kodesh; it's mikdash. And then arm shall stand on his part. Now that word part is, is, is the word min. And min is also just means from, right? So that's why when you put a, uh, the letter M in front of a word, it, 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 it's just adding it as a prefix. But here it is as a separate, uh, uh, word. So, so on his part and, and stand, Ahmad, that means to stand and arms. So this is military force. So military force shall stand with him and they shall pollute. Um, so this word here is like to defile, right? They're going to defile the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily. So we know it's not the heavenly sanctuary, but can it be the earthly sanctuary? Well, it's applying to the earthly sanctuary. It's a bit of outer saint. So the earthly sanctuary would have been destroyed. Right. Quite a okay. few years previously. Right. So it can't be referring to the earthly sanctuary and it can't be referring to the heavenly sanctuary. That means it's not referring to God's sanctuary. The word takeaway, is that, uh, room, uh, that, uh, lift up and exalt? No, this is to remove. That's sir. Right. Same in verse 31. So what they're going to do is they're going to take away the daily. That means to remove, right? That is the one that should be translated as take away. In chapter 8, they have the word room, which means to lift up and exalt. Now, can't okay. it, is, can't it, ain't it, don't it, ain't this talking about this uh, strength of um, paganism? Wouldn't it be okay. like sanctuary of strength? Of strength, wouldn't that be paganism? Okay, yeah. So so they're going to have to remove paganism, right? Wow. That, that's the daily. So they're going to have to pollute the sanctuary strength and take away the daily. So we know the daily is paganism. Right. Wow. So we need to understand, well, what is the sanctuary of strength that they pollute? How do they pollute it? Um, well, wouldn't it be pagan gods and stuff? Well, that's what we're going to look at, okay? Okay. Right. Let's, 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 let's just do it step by step. Okay, so we know the daily is the counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. That's pagan sacrifices, animal sacrifices. It's a counterfeit of of the sacrificial system that God set up, right? And then they shall place, that word place is the word natan, right? That is, they shall give, because it means gift, like in Jonathan, gift of Jehovah, or Nathaniel, gift of God. So they shall give, the abomination that makes desolate. Okay. Now, now the word abomination here, sakuts, that is filth, disgusting, idolatrous, abominable filth, right? Which is using a word to define it. Uh, detestable thing, right? So they're going to place or give something that's abominable, right? It is idolatrous. And that, that thing, this, um, abomination, it maketh desolate. And, and that idea there is uh, to stun, that is to devastate or stupefy, uh, make amazed, be astonished. So that's what's going to be given. This is, of course, we know this is the papacy. Now, 
When we go back to chapter eight, this is where people have the problems with this. Uh, in verse 11, uh, yea, he magnified himself even to, uh, that's the word ad, so you could translate it against, uh, the prince of the host. So he's going to magnify himself against the prince of the host. Now, who magnifies himself against the prince of the host? Be wrong. This is wrong, pagan Rome, right? It's going to crucify Christ. And from him, so it says by him in the King James, but that word by is that word mim, which means from. From him, the daily, tamid, sacrifice is an added word, was taken away. This is the room. So it's going to be lifted up and exalted. And it says here, the place of his sanctuary, again, that's going to be mikdash, and uh, the word place, makom, right? So it's the place of his sanctuary that is going to be cast down, shalak, to th be thrown down. And then a host was given him against the daily. So here we have the word against again. And then the daily, tamid, sacrifice is added. By reason of transgression, okay, because of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So we're going to see that first paganism sanctuary is going to be cast down and a host is going to be given against paganism by reason of transgression. And this is now an it. It's a feminine. It cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. So this is talking about the papacy. Right. So we should be familiar with this. But one thing we see here is we see the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, so in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, we have some similar similar ideas, uh, but there's a difference, right? So we have the words take away, but they're two different words. Right? One means to lift up and exalt. The other one means to, to remove, right? to take away. But if it talks here about polluting the sanctuary of strength, can we say that this is the same sanctuary or the place where that sanctuary is in the first one, right, in, in chapter 8, verse 11? Is this then the pagan sanctuary? So papal Rome, does it pollute the sanctuary of strength, the pagan sanctuary? Yeah, it takes away the, it takes away. Okay, but does it, but, but before we get to the takeaway, does it pollute the pagan sanctuary of strength? Yeah. Is this? Okay, how does it do that? Puts it first and then takes it away. Okay, so, okay, but don't deal with the takeaway. The thing is, how does it pollute the sanctuary of strength? So the sanctuary of strength, we're saying, is this pagan it sanctuary. Up. It sets up its own, its own. Okay, so it sets up its own in Rome, right? Yeah. So we know that in order for the papacy to be to exalt paganism, right? It shall, it shall lift up paganism. It's going to lift up paganism, but also it's going to be opposed to paganism, right? It's going to transition from a counterfeit of the earthly to a counterfeit of the heavenly. So if it's polluting the sanctuary of strength, what is that specifically that it's doing? It's mixing, it's mixing Christianity with paganism. Okay. So it's taking the pagan symbols and making them into so-called Christian symbols. Now, this sanctuary of strength refers to the sanctuary of military might. So, so I'm not saying that that's not correct. But remember, it, it, it says in the first part of the verse, an arm shall stand on his part. So we're going to have these pagan Rome, right? It's going to be conquered by the Germanic tribes, right? That's what it's talking about in verse 30. So if we go back to verse 30, we know the ships of Kittim, they're going to come against Western Rome. Uh, therefore, he shall be grieved and return. So we have this return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So that is, there still is a persecution of Christians happening during this time by pagan Rome. Even though pagan Rome, you know, Constantine has 
has, you know, you have the Edict of Milan in 313, and and then you have the movement of the capital of Rome from Rome to Constantinople. So how is he having indignation against the Holy Covenant here? Because, in a sense, the the state religion has has almost become a type of Christianity. My understanding of those Christians who were persecuted after Council of Nicaea were those who were highly Trinitarian. Okay, so you're gonna so you're gonna have well, I, I wouldn't put anti-Trinitarian because when I look at that history, I, I don't think the issue is about the Trinity. You know, because uh, if you read uh, A.T. Jones, can't remember if it's in the Two Republics or um, Ecclesiastical History book, with whatever Ecclesiastical Empire. I can't remember which book it's in, but really, it, it was more a power struggle over whether Christ was of the subs- same substance as the Father or of a different substance, which doesn't really mean anything because we don't know what substance God's made of and what that even means. But uh, but it was definitely a power struggle that was going on uh, between two groups wanting to have control. So it wasn't really about the issue. It was some other thing. It was just about control. So the question is, so you're trying to say, well, you've got a group of Christians persecuting another group of Christians in that history. But we have this holy covenant. So if they're going to have indignation against the holy covenant, uh, and then they're going to have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant, this would mean that this these groups that come in, these Germanic groups, what is it that they're doing? Because they're going to cause the fall of the Roman Empire, right? And Basically, these these tribes are going to take over Western Rome and provide the people that are going to create these different nations. We have to have something more clear, something not so vague. Okay, so first off, what about the word indignation? If they have indignation against the Holy Covenant, what is the indignation? Okay, what's the last? What's the last end of the indignation? Well, thank you. Related it. To the 2520, but you really know the 1260. Okay, so there, there's two 1260s, right? And and we can have the first end of the indignation. The first end of the indignation is the 1260 from 723 BC to 538. Does that seem fair? Jeff so related that to you know, the whole 2520, I believe. And right, so look. Okay. Seventeen ninety eight. Yeah, yeah, the whole twenty five twenty, and and I would agree in a sense because there's two ends of the indignation: the first twenty twelve sixty and the last twelve sixty. Well, with one you got five thirty eight, seventeen ninety eight, and then the other one you got seventeen ninety eight and eighteen forty four. Yeah, I understand, but I'm saying the indignation is. The two 1260s, not the 2520 for Judah. So I know what Jeff says, but I would say the indignation is referring to these two counterfeit, you know, three and a half years. That is, the counterfeit of Christ three and a half years. So, so in this set, in this sentence here, it says the ships of Kittim shall come against him. So that's going to be against Rome. He shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So this is Rome that is grieved and returns and has indignation against the Holy Covenant. So pagan Rome is going to continue to persecute Christians. Is that what it's saying? It's going to continue its work of persecuting. Now we say, well, Rome became Christian, right, in that in that history. So he's going to, re- Rome, pagan Rome, in this time that it's being attacked in the time that it's falling it's being it's being attacked by these germanic tribes so if it's if it's grieved right so this word grieved means to be sad or broken uh, it's going to return that shuv it has this indignation za'am right anger right and this indignation we see in um so daniel 11 verse 30 is the only place it is in daniel 
and, and I'm equating it with the last end of the indignation, which is a different word. I'm just going to show you this here. So they're going to talk about the last end of the indignation. It's, it's really the same word. It's just one number different. So in Daniel 8, 19, at the last end of the indignation, that what shall be at the last end of the indignation for at the time appointed the end shall be. So, um, so in 8, 19, it talks about the indignation. They're basically the same word. It's just, uh, uh, this other one is, what's the difference? They're, they're spelt the same. They're spelt the same. I'm not really sure why they're different numbers. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So as, as a question with this, looking at Hebrew 2194. Yeah. Using rule of first mention, we would have to go back to numbers 23, 7, and 8. Yeah. 23, 7, and 8. Now, if I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly, Zom, the word, um, yeah, properly to foam at the mouth, that is to be enraged. Yeah. So when we're looking at this with numbers 23, 7, and 8, we're looking, as it is being said, and I would have to think prophetically, and he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? Yeah, so the word defied. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, we also, so to me, they're the same word. I'm not sure why there's two different Hebrew numbers um, for them. Um, so we also have indignation 2195. Right, which we see in Daniel eight nineteen and in Daniel eleven thirty six, um, um, and it says he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that determined shall be done. So one of the things we can see is that um, that the indignation is accomplished in seventeen ninety eight, right? Because this is going to be talking about the papacy. So we can show that the indignation doesn't continue to eighteen forty four. It ends in 1798. But there's a last end of the indignation and there's the first end. And, and I'm arguing that the indignation that's being referred to in verse 30 there, that that indignation is the first 1260. That's all I'm trying to say here. That there's two indignations, the daily and the abomination of, that make it desolate. Both of these are indignations. So what they're going to talk about here is... The first indignation in verse 30, that's going to be grieved return, and that's going to be that indignation. And it persecutes God's people, right? It's going to be against the Holy Covenant. And then it's going to have this word, so shall he do, which they always keep. Sometimes they'll say he did, does exploits, but, you know, it's just he shall do, 6213. And then he shall return. And then he's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So we have pagan Rome persecuting God's people. That's the first indignation, the first end of the indignation. That's the 1260 of paganism, the daily. And so so he's going to be grieved and returned and have indignation. So that means there is a persecution that's happening in this period of time. But there are going to be those that forsake the Holy Covenant. That would be apostate Christianity. And so he's going to have intelligence with apostate Christianity. And this is happening during the time of the fall of Rome, if I read it correctly. And then in verse 31, we have arm standing on his part. And we're saying that that's Clovis. And the polluting of the sanctuary of strength is marking the end of paganism of earthly, you know, sacrifices. And that's going to result in the taking away of the daily and giving the abomination that make it desolate. So placing the abomination that make it desolate. So the daily is taken away and then we place the abomination that make it desolate. So those, those are going to be the two indignations, right? And that's why in verse 36, when it talks about the papacy, Right. Rising. So it's 
it's going to be this whole transition. We know that the daily is taken away in verse 31. But the king that does according to his will, that shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, that has to be the papacy, right? And that has to be in 1798 that the indignation is accomplished. So this this history of them that have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, um, this really has to do with the transition from paganism with its connection with papalism. Does, does that make sense with apostate Christianity? Can you restate your question? Okay. So pagan Rome, which paganism, the daily, is going to have intelligence with apostate Christianity. That's what it means. They shall have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. All right. Okay. So this is dealing with the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. This is what's happening. And we could say this intelligence um, it involves lots of things. But, but the idea here is that there is an agreement between paganism and papalism that develops because of because the fact is that Christianity is apostate. And so that's so part of this taking away of the daily, because we know that according to Second Thessalonians, so we know that Second Thessalonians is quoting this passage, right? Paul is quoting this passage in Daniel chapter eleven, right? All right. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's verse 36 of Daniel 11, right? We know that there's this falling away. So this falling away is what happens to Christianity. So Paul is understanding Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 to 36. He's basically summing up these verses, maybe if you include, you know, you could probably include verse 38, right, all the way up to there. I mean, this is one of the arguments I have for that this cannot be referring to, verse 36 cannot be referring to Turkey, because it's pretty clear that Paul is understanding this in the context of the man of sin, which is the papacy. So now Uriah Smith will say, well, the first part is, up here, this is the papacy. But when we get to verse 36, we're now going to be introducing Turkey, right? And he says, if it said a king, it would be introducing a new power. But it doesn't say a king, it says that king, right? So it doesn't the, fall. What's that? One of the uh, arguments for this being Turkey is that it says there shall do according to his will. Mm -hmm. that the king here. So that's uh, if you look at the other examples in verse 16 and verse I think it's verse 5 or 4 or maybe it's yeah. 3 you have like an introduction to a new so previously in verse 15 you had Greece there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. You have Greece and, then, and you have Rome. And then, and then it have... says and he, and he shall do according to his will. So right. that's introducing Rome. Right. Verse 16. And then with uh, the end of Meda Persia, you have Alexander, he shall do according to his will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the argument this year is introducing a new power because of that phrase doing according to his will. So they're saying, just done that in verse 3 or whatever it is, and mm -hmm. then verse 16. So therefore, this is verse 36 is introducing a new power. So that's one of the arguments. Yeah. Well, that's the argument I use why it's the papacy. Because these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, each one of them, right? Turkey's yeah, not. I, I, yeah. Well, so, so yeah, so they say the argument there it does seem as if it's talking about the king is talking about the previous power in verse thirty-five. Then what they will say, but it's saying shall do according to his will. So that's introducing a new power. Yeah, so, I, I understand, but. That, that makes no sense. So, because, yes, 
it is introducing a new power, but it's a new power that's a kingdom of Bible prophecy. And so when you get to verse 36, it's going to address the Pope himself. So before that, it doesn't, right? It's it's going to talk about the abomination that makes it desolate. But that is like the daily is the daily a specific person. No, right? Um, and it's going to place the abomination that make it desolate. That is, that is describing the papacy as a system of belief, right? It's a, it's a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. But it's not till verse 36 that we actually address the king himself, the papacy, the pope. Uh, I get your point. Yeah. And, and, and it wouldn't make sense, of course, because all of these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy of Daniel. Now you're going to say that, or, you know, people are going to say, well, now this is the, this is Turkey. Well, Turkey is not a kingdom of Bible prophecy. Plus, the characteristics here are the same characteristics in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that Paul attributes to the man of sin. I agree. And also, Ellen White, when she yeah. quotes us here, um, in 13MR, whatever it is, she will quote verses 30 to 36. Yeah. And then say scenes similar to this shall take place. So mm-hmm. it wouldn't make sense to quote verse 36 if it's a new subject. She would have, she would, if it was another par, she would have just said verses 30 to 35. Right. No, I mean, I mean, I have, I don't give any credence to the view that this is referring to France. Or, or, and I said Turkey, but I meant it, it's referring to France because Turkey is going to be the king of the north. So Uriah Smith's view is that this is France. This is the new power that's being introduced. I don't know why I said Turkey. Yeah, I should have called him there as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's just I was thinking about, you know, Turkey and the king of the north and all that. So so this is France. So he's saying that this is France that's the new power. And France is not a kingdom of Bible prophecy, right? It's not going to be... You have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome is the last kingdom. And and so to introduce France here now and say, well, France, this is talking about France. And one of the main arguments they use has to do that that he magnifies himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. So they're saying, well, this is atheism, right? So that, that's why it's France. But it yeah. says he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. and And that's not true of France. Right. France doesn't end in 1798. And and also he doesn't regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Well, that's what it says in Second Th- Seth, Seth Thessalonians chapter two about the man of sin. So uh, there's just no way I, I just cannot accept. I mean, and I know you're not arguing for it. You're bringing up these arguments, but there's just no way that you can accept that this is France. And that France is going to be the one that comes against Egypt and then against uh, Turkey in in connection with the time of the end, 1798. I mean, there's just there's just so many things about it. Um, but also, it doesn't flow with what we're saying about the indignation. So the indignation here that's going to be accomplished is 1798 because the papacy is going to prosper till the indignation be accomplished. And that's going to be the last end of the indignation, right? The first end is the indignation in verse 31. So that's the 1260, okay? So so when we go back to these verses now, so um, in our in our notes, because we really need to edit these, um, <clears throat> So we go to verse 30, uh, in which the ships of Kitten, the Germanic tribal invasion, shall come against him, Western Rome, and shall be grieved in return and have indignation. So this indignation I'm going to mark as uh, against the Holy Covenant, right? So this is going to be God's people. Paganism tries to destroy Christianity. So shall he do. He, pagan Rome, shall even return. So I'm going to place this in 538 um, and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. That is papal Rome. And then we have now to maybe say that this is 538. 
I don't know if that's maybe the best date, but it's in that history. So the question is, what is paganism trying to do to destroy Christianity in that history? Now, we know that paganism kind of ends quite a bit before. So that's one of the criticisms people have about the taking away of the daily in 508, because they say, well, you know, Clovis is already, you know, a lot of the tribes are, you know, sort of Christian, right? So, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to explain this, but we know that that we mark 508 and that Clovis's conversion when he's baptized on December 25th, 508. That's where we have decided that we mark that, that event. So when we're going to have this, his returning, maybe 538 is not the best time. So, I mean, probably what you would do is just put this from, I would say 313 to 538. Does that seem reasonable? That this refers to a period of time in which pagan Rome is having intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. That there's this process going on during this period of time. Now, we can maybe put it, I don't know, when does the first Germanic tribes come in and start uh, dealing with Western Rome? And see, part of it here is you have Western Rome and Eastern Rome. Now, Eastern Rome under, you know, the capital of Rome is Constantinople, but it's Western Rome is going to be the one that falls. Um, when do we have the first Germanic tribes coming in? Because I don't know, maybe I can find it. So. I think the uh, 1843 chart has some dates. Okay. Do you remember any of them offhand? I, I just <laughs> pick up. <clears throat> okay, so you're going to have the first angel. I'm just going to look here. Roy Smith says. So he's going to quote from Alexander Keith. So he's going to have Alaric ravaging the Eastern Empire. Okay. That's the first trumpet. Gibbon's going to comment on it. Uh, you know, I've looked at this history before. It's a lot more complex than what we get, you know, from these commentaries. Uh, the second angel they're going to have as after the Constantine the Great was divided into three parts. So the third part in the place to invasion of Constantine. So Genseric, the Vandals. So I, I would generally put the Vandals as the point that we're going to mark in Daniel because that's going to be the ships of Kitten, right? The 1843 chart for the Vandals has 407, and quite a few others are noted as 407. So I think okay. it was in the, uh, it was early in that year, I think they have the event called the Crossing of the Rhine, where they just flood over the Rhine. Okay. It's like uh, several tribes. Okay, so we can say, um, now when you're saying that uh, he, pagan Rome, shall return, and then I'm putting 508 to 538, or, or pardon me, 407 to 538. So that's um, 131 years, that period of time. And have intelligence with them for, that forsake the Holy Covenant. So the idea is that they're returning, um, what would that mean? If we're going to put this returning in connection with the ships of Kitten, uh, why would we put this Rome is going to return? Because Rome is the one that keeps returning. Right, he's going to return. He's going to return again. Right. So we have him returning here. And then he's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So with apostate Christianity. So I have a suggestion. Okay. So you have, for instance, in uh, Great Britain, you have most of uh, basically England. You have up until Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. Is, uh, Controlled by Rome. Yeah. It's not, it's not invaded by any tribes. But what happens is the, uh, they are just, because of tribes coming in in other parts of the kingdom, because of the Goths, the crossing of Ryan and so forth. Yeah. That they have to, they withdraw their forces from Great Britain. Okay. So in a sense, they're being returned 
to the Roman Empire to defend uh, the territory elsewhere. You know, otherwise they would be just cut off. So it's kind of consolidating yeah. forces. Okay, so what, what year do you want to have that as? Now I'm going to get rid of the 538. I'm just going to put the year that they return here. Um, so, yeah, sometime after, um, probably not long after that, 407. I'd have to sort of see, uh, it probably took over a while. It took a while for them to. Yeah, to we just to probably, it. when they first started doing it or whatever, if we mm -hmm. have a year. It could, I think 407 sounds good. It could okay. be, to sort of, I think it's that event, sort of an issue that, okay, we bought a pet of our armies okay. from Britain and bring them to the other parts of the kingdom. Okay. So they're, so they're going to return. That is, um, that Rome now starts to focus upon what's happening with the fall of its empire, right? That's how you, and, and then in connection with that, it's going to have intelligence with apostate Christianity. Okay. Maybe that's better, right? And then we're going to have 508 where Clovis is baptized. So that's where we're going to have arms standing on his part. And, and the so Wikipedia, Wikipedia gives 410. 410? For the relieving of Britain, Britain. Okay. Okay, we'll put that then, 410. Well, that gives us a nice round number. So they have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, apostate Christianity. Okay, so does this kind of make a bit more sense then if we connect this to what has happened before? So we've, we have them referring to the time appointed as being November 9th, 1989, because they're referring to the Moed, right? That's the time appointed is connected with the time of the end. And we're going to have this, but it shall not be as the former, what happened in 30 BC, or as the latter. So that is, we're dealing with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So, you know, we might even say um, here, um, 410 to 476. So we'll put that there. In which the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Um, so these are the Germanic tribal invasions. And because of that, he's going to be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He, pagan Rome, shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So they're going to have indignation against those that are the Holy Covenant, God's people. And they're going to have intelligence with apostate Christianity. And that's going to lead to that history leads to what happens in that period from 508 to 538. Clovis being baptized and the military power of France placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth. Right, setting up the abomination that make it desolate. Okay. Could it be that uh, they're having ignorant, ignorant indignation against the Holy Covenant by forming an alliance with those okay. who are against it? Or I like that. It? Okay, that makes sense. So this makes actually quite a bit of sense, and I'll try to explain it. Um, so one of the criticisms of the 1260 is both both one for pagan Rome and, and the one for papal Rome. Both of them have this criticism. Persecution did not occur for 1260 years by paganism against the Jews and Christians. There's periods of persecution. Same with papal Rome. I mean, there wasn't constant persecution of Christians from 538 to 1798. We know that. Okay. Uh, there's going to be periods of persecution. Now, what we do have, though, is this idea of indignation. That is, there is, what was the other word that was used, uh, Dwight, in um, in that other passage? The first mention of the word indignation? Defy. What was that? Defiling? De defying. Defying. Defying, defying yes, defying. And, and so can we say that that's really what's happening? It's, it's not so much about the persecution itself, but these counterfeits, um, 
definitely defying the truth, right? There, it's indignation against something, and and that can be just even in their own the characteristics that are contrary to Christ. The rejection of the gospel can be part of that indignation. Broad, then, right? There. The word indignation here is kind of broad. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be direct persecution of Christians, burning them at the stake and all that kind of stuff. It just it just has to be that this is an indignation against the Holy Covenant and, and the Holy there, Kodesh and Covenant Barrett. Yeah, so so pagan Rome is now it says it shall return, and then pagan Rome again shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So there's these two returnings. One is to have indignation against the Holy Covenant, and so shall he do. And then he's also going to return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, right? So these are two contrasting ideas, the indignation against the Holy Covenant and the intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Jeff, you had a comment? I was going to say, that's, you're saying that's the two phases of Rome? Um, not so much two phases. It's just, it's a contrast between uh, pagan Rome's uh, rejection of the Holy Covenant and its intelligence with papal Rome or with, with apostate Christianity prior to the rise of the 1260, prior to the daily being taken away. And, and in order for the daily to be taken away, um, we're going to see that Clovis' baptism and the military might of France, of this Germanic nation, uh, is, is going to eventually pollute the sanctuary of strength, that is, remove paganism, um, the corrupt earthly church with false doctrine. That's what... Um, he has, Swearington has. I, I think I'd probably uh, change that. And and then usurp Christ's intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. Swearington seems to have like a uh, a mixture of the, the new view of the daily and the old view of the daily. But I'm just going to say that remove paganism. And then take away the daily. So, um, so I don't know if remove paganism should be there. I have to think about that a bit more, what this the polluting of the sanctuary of strength is because the taking away of the daily, it's obviously like this turning people's hearts away from Christ's intercessory ministry. I don't think that's what the abomination of desolation is. Okay. So we're going to have to look at that tomorrow then verse uh, 31 and 32. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for the help. Let's close with prayer. Dear father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. We just pray for you continued presence throughout this day as we consider the things we have studied this morning we know we have still so much to learn and we are thankful for your help and guidance i pray that you can bless each person who's participated and those that watch these videos uh, that your holy spirit can work in their lives and we ask for your angels care and protection in jesus name we pray